Welcome to the New Planner Podcast, where it's all about helping you successfully enter the financial planning profession and accelerate your financial planning career. This podcast will help you understand the profession, become familiar with the various career paths available to you, and avoid the mistakes that limit your success. Join your host, Caleb Brown, to explore the human side of creating a successful planning career through interviews, personal experience, and insights from the trenches. Let's get started. Welcome to the 169th episode of the New Planner Podcast. This is Caleb Brown, your host. My guest today is Devin Patel a financial advisor at Windsor Wealth Planners and Strategist in Gainesville, Georgia. Listen as Devin shares what he does each day as he splits his time helping senior planners serve existing clients and the remaining time building his own book of business. He goes on to talk about why he wanted a role that was structured this way and how he was able to get his foot in the door. Check out the middle two where he discusses how he built up his confidence to be leading most of the planning meetings with existing clients after less than two years in the business how his past work experiences have accelerated his career growth, plus how he passed the Series 65 and CFP exam. Be sure to stay tuned to the end too, where he talks about how he gets clients, the business development goals he has set for himself, and what niche client he is targeting. If you're seeking more of a hybrid role where you support an existing set of clients, but also bring in your own clients, then this episode is for you. Hi, Devin. Welcome to the New Planner Podcast. Hey, how's it going, Caleb? Going great. Thank you so much for making time for us. We almost didn't get this scheduled. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Those pesky clients. Well, tell us about, maybe change it up a little bit. What are you doing right now? What's your role? Describe that for us. Well, I kind of have two different roles. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of working on building my own book of business as, you know, a financial advisor, but then I'm also working as an associate financial planner under the three partners that I work for. So, yeah, I mean, day to day, working on prospecting pretty much every day. And then uh, also in almost every single client meeting that we have in this office, typically running right the meetings. Okay. Got it. It sounds like it's a hybrid role, right? So you're helping working on existing clients and doing a lot of the associate planner stuff for these three senior people, but then you're also trying to bring in your own clients. Exactly. Which is, you know, that's exactly what I was looking for because I wanted the whole business owner side of it. But then also, I mean, you know how hard it is to start from scratch, especially at this age to uh, 25. That's fascinating. Talk to us about how it's going on the associate planner sort of support side, and then we'll get to the prospecting. Yeah. So the associate planner side has been an incredible experience for me, mainly because I'm in every single client meeting. I'm preparing for the meetings. I'm building the plans. I'm doing all the follow-up, stuff like that. I mean, that experience that I'm getting from that, practicing on their clients before I take it over to my side of the book, is just incredible. And all the support that I get from them and all the, the coaching along the way and stuff like that is just, it's awesome. That does sound like you're getting a good deal there. You get to practice on yeah. somebody else's clients. So are they in there with you to kind of get some guardrails in case you're like, oh, whoops, got a question here. Not sure how to handle this one or oop, left that out on the plane. Are they helping you there? They are. Yeah. So uh, the lead planner here, she's kind of involved in every single planning meeting, just like I am. I always send stuff to her and she always gives me feedback and stuff like that before we even go into the meeting. And then there's also feedback after the meeting too. And yeah, I mean, it's great being young and having somebody that's had so much experience there sitting next to me while I'm going through all that stuff. In those meetings, who's doing most of the talking? Is that you or the other senior people? It's mainly me. I mean, you know, like the personal interactions and stuff like that. I don't know the clients as well as they do. So they kind of you know, butter me up and then I, then I get the details and all that stuff. They position you correctly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just so the audience, I mean, how long have you been out of school now? How much experience do you have is what I'm getting at. I graduated in May of 22. I started in this business, not at this firm, but at another firm in Atlanta in a CSA role. Um, so I started in July of 22 and was in that CSA role for probably eight months. And then I was living up here in Flyer Branch and I, was, and I didn't love the role because, you know, after graduating from the University of Georgia with a financial planning degree, I felt like all the stuff that I had learned at school was kind of being wasted on just doing paperwork and stuff like that. So then I saw that this role had came up in like January or maybe December, January of 22. And it was an associate financial planning position here in Gainesville. And I, was, and I was living up here at the time with my parents. It was almost like a dream come true because I didn't have to drive an hour and a half down there and all that. Down into Atlanta. Down into Atlanta. Yeah. Okay. So the location wasn't necessarily a fit. The client service stuff. I mean, I've talked about that before. I mean, at some degree, you need to know sort of the paperwork and the process. But yeah, I mean, I'm with you. If you're wanting to do planning and they've just got you doing that with no end in sight. 
I mean, it's, you know, time for a discussion or potentially a move if you have to. So, okay. So, I mean, you're not even two years into this thing because we're recording this in January of 2024. I'm just trying to understand, like, how many plans have you gone in and presented? Or, I mean, I'm just, how did you get the confidence and the skills built up to be able to do this with not a lot of experience? To be honest, those kind of skills I didn't really learn from the financial planning industry. It was the CFP program. Is that what you mean? The CFP program? Yeah. Yeah. The CFP yeah, program okay. doesn't really, I mean, obviously you need all the technical skills and, and the knowledge on how all the plans work and stuff like that. But the soft skills I kind of learned outside growing up through high school and college, because I was always working in the service industry. So I think that that really helped me a lot too. And then, you know, my, my dad owned businesses too. So I was always working on my soft skills since I've been like 14. So uh, I think that that really helped me transition into, you know, leading these meetings and stuff like that. And then my financial planning degree gave me all the confidence and stuff like that. So I was just gleaning your LinkedIn profile. And I mean, for the people that aren't going to look at it, I mean, like general manager, Marco's Pizza, iron worker, project manager, chief financial officer, bartender. You've had some, <laughs> some experience there. Yeah. The bartending one is actually, it's probably helped me the most, honestly, just talking to people and building rapport and stuff like that. Yeah. You, you make the wrong drink. Someone's yelling at you. Someone <laughs> doesn't pay. I mean, like, yeah, it's a lot of fun, right? You know, with the pizza stuff too. I mean, just dealing with angry customers all the time. I feel like that's really helped me a lot too. So, okay. All right, cool. That's really neat. So it sounds like uh, things are going really well. And maybe how many clients are you kind of second chair on and helping these senior people with? You know, we probably, between everybody, there's probably 250, 300 households. And of those, there's probably 180 to 200 planning clients. So I'm involved in almost all those, except for maybe 10, 15. And you touched on this a little earlier about the positioning, but what was it like when you, sort of showed up and you're the new guy, you're the young guy, you know, and everybody else, the senior people have been working with these clients for, you know, months or years or decades or whatever it is. And how did you feel going into that situation? It's very scary at first, especially, you know, new guy on the block. And that was before I had passed the CFP exam. So really I didn't have, I didn't have anything other than my initial licensing. So it's kind of like, who are you? Who's this young guy in here leading this meeting? Does he know what he's talking about? But you know, just confidence and then everything I've learned over the past three or four years in financial planning has just helped me tremendously. Any pushback like, hey, we love that Devin joined the firm and passed the 65, like, but like, we don't want to deal with him. Did that ever come up? No, not really, because the lead advisor is always in there too. So there was really n never any pushback. And all these clients, most of them have been with these advisors for several years. Like I think since I've been here, we've only had a handful of new clients. So the confidence has always been there with those people. It's just them letting me practice and stuff like that. The clients have been pretty easy, actually. You mentioned licensing. I think so you did pass the CFP. I did. Is that right? And then you have a, what is it, a Series 65? Mm-hmm. Yep. Before we get to the prospecting, Sachs, I do want to spend some time on that. Just talk to us about any tips you have about approaching the 65 and the CFP and how you got through those. So the 65 is definitely a lot easier than the CFP. You know, I, I love Kaplan. I don't know why, but I, this kind of been my preferred test prep person. You know, studying for the 65 is pretty straightforward. The questions are a little tricky with all those double negatives and stuff like that. But um, really what I was doing, I, you know, I was using Google and going through and doing the QBank questions. I'm sure that you've heard of that, place, but I, I was just nailed in those questions like all day or probably two or three weeks. And then I was able to pass the 65. So that one wasn't too challenging, but the CFP was a totally different story. It probably took longer than two or three weeks to study for the CFP. Didn't it? Yeah, that, that was years in the making. But uh, yeah, I think I emailed you like back in uh, 22 asking like, you know, how long do you think I should study for it? And you were like, 300 hours, definitely. I was like, okay. So that was three months of basically working, coming home, studying till I go to bed and waking up in the morning and doing the same exact thing for three solid months and weekends included and stuff like that. But the biggest thing that I think that helped me pass the CFP exam was going to an in-person review class. It was like a five-day course that Kaplan had that was included in like my CFP study program. The professor was on the board of, uh, I guess, the certified financial planning, whoever makes it. So he knew all his content. He knew what you're going to be tested on, stuff like that. And that class was a month before the exam. And that helped me figure out my weaknesses. And it also helped me just recap everything that I've been studying for you know the past two years and stuff like that. That's great. I mean, the in-person review, I mean, the world of virtual sort of easy, you know, learning more convenient. That's 
Interesting you brought that up. I did something similar to that. I went to an in person. It was a long time ago before the virtual stuff, but I went in person and I learned better that way. And it just it held me accountable and it sounded like it was successful for you and got me through as well. Okay. So congrats on passing both of those. I mean, that's, Thank you. that's tough and that shows that you're serious. And talk to us about how many months have you been trying to bring in clients and build your own book? Almost a year, two or three weeks shy of a year of trying to prospect and do all that. It's going, but uh, like the past month has really been when the growth has started kicking on. Like the, the whole year before, um, it's been close family members that have you know, signed up. But uh, now it's starting to branch out to my friends, my, my parents' friends, stuff like that. And it's not like I have a set prospecting thing. It's more of just me getting involved in the community as much as I can. I joined a young men's group up here. It's for men under 40. It's like a nonprofit organization. And I'm also serving on like a fundraising committee of another nonprofit. But one thing that I started doing this semester or in January, actually, was I'm coaching lacrosse at Gainesville High School. Okay. <laughs> so I'm hoping to, you know, meet more members of the community that way and stuff like that. I'm glad you shared that because like the high school team, right? Your kid mm-hmm. is it? Yeah. So I mean, like these parents that are paying for lacrosse or whatever, I mean, like, you know, they probably have some financial planning needs. You know? <laughs> That's what I'm hoping. You know, it just helps me build my name around Gainesville too, because Gainesville is pretty small. I mean, it's grown a lot, but it's still a pretty small town. A couple key points, I think on the marketing here, I love how you're saying I'm taking the slow road. You know, I mean, you're just getting into this. I mean, this is your early in your career, you're one year and you're not going around. It sounds like not beating down door, like hey, I'm the Devin, you know, you need to work with me. I'm a, you know, I'm new CF. It's like, nope, I'm developing relationships. I'm getting involved in the community. And eventually people will start like, you know, that Devin guy, he's popping up everywhere. Like, what do you do again? I mean, that's the way to do it, man. Yeah, you're on the right track. So can you share some number? I mean, like you said, you had some family and friends. I mean, how are you measuring it? Is it like in planning fees or revenue or AUM or just households or what? How are you doing this thus far? So I guess the best way to measure it for me is AUM. You know, we do charge planning fees, but most of my clients are not just paying that planning fee. The AUM covers it. I think my AUM is at 2.8 million and I probably have six or seven households. Nothing crazy, but it's a start. I'm going to round that up. So you got 3 million, five or six households. That's a great start, man. For some established firms, big firms, that aren't. I mean, like they may just do that in a quarter, you know? I mean, so, but you can see how this grows. Once you get clients, then you can start getting referrals. And I remember talking to you guys about this in the practice management class when everybody's like, I'm just going to get referrals. That's my marketing plan. I was like, well, how are you going to get the clients first to get their, them to get their referrals from? Right. Which, I mean, your practice management class has been, I've learned so many useful things in there. Yeah, it's been great. I appreciate that. Yeah. I'm glad I didn't run you off and you stuck with it. Okay. So do you have goals or have your supervisors given you goals or are they kind of just taking a laissez-faire approach on, hey, he's putting forth some effort. He gets, I mean, what, what's that structure look like? Yeah. So the goal is to obviously, the end goal is for me to be completely off salary and just being paid completely through AUM. What number that is, is kind of up for discussion for us to have. And they know that it takes several years to get to where you can actually do that. And so they're, they're flexible with me. So we don't have any set goals like yearly so far, but I think that's going to change in February because that's when I have my uh, performance review. And I think that we're going to lay out some stuff like that. But the goal that I have set for this year is I'm going to try to bring in $5 million. Okay. And that's a great sort of big annual goal. And do you have it broken down, like what you need to do each quarter, what you need to do each month? I mean, like activity-wise, do you, do you have it down to that level? I kind of do. I'm starting to build these newsletters that I'm going to start sending out people to. Just something short that I can send to all my current clients, and hopefully they'll send it along to other people. And then you know, it's just hitting the activities in town, going to as many meetings as I can, shaking as many hands as I can. I'm also going to start hammering more friends and family as I see them more. I mean, not like beating down their door, like you said, but kind of seeing them in passing, mentioning it, stuff like that. Do you have a subject matter expert niche or a client? It sounds like you're just kind of trying to get in front of as many people as you can. I mean, I mean, do you have a niche or anything at this point? Yeah. You know, I think it's starting to lean towards nonprofits, honestly. A lot of the members in our group here work with a lot of nonprofits and are on the boards of a lot of nonprofits. One of my clients I just onboarded is a nonprofit. Uh, I mean, it's a new nonprofit, but we're going to start working on building an endowment fund for them. It's for adults with special needs. It's called the Fun Club, uh, Our Friends You Need. It's, it's located in Buford, but that's something that I've really been working towards and I'm hoping to help more nonprofits and stuff like that. Other than that, it's really, you know, younger clients. 
like nonprofits would be a great niche for me to get into, but really my, I guess, ideal client right now is younger clients under like 40. And that's interesting to me because you've gotten some of those people and you've historically, those people have not been ideal targets and candidates for big AUM accounts, right? Because they're just accumulating. So it's interesting to me that you're going for kind of the Henry's, right? The high income, not rich yet folks, but you're still charging the fee. So no planning fee or no subscription fee or anything like that. Well, so with those guys, most of those younger people, they're not doing planning at this point. We're kind of setting up their emergency fund and then working out short-term goals, no detailed planning there. Like I have a couple of friends that are engaged and stuff, and that will turn into a planning fee, like a full detailed plan. But I really want to go after the Henry's because I'd rather work with clients for a couple of years, grow their, all their assets, because I'm not in any rush to gather as many assets as possible in this year. You know, like it's more of a long-term game for me. It's almost like dinks too, dinks like dual income, no kids. I mean, and the funny thing about this is if you talk to all your senior people, that's how they got started a long time ago. And the clients just grew with them and that's what's going to happen with you. So that's what I'm hoping. This is awesome, Devin. And maybe just take us back a little bit too. I mean, it's not like your family had some businesses and you had a lot of work history and, and a lot of different jobs and industries, which is one, why I think you're having success that you are now. Why did you even get into financial planning? You could have done anything. It's funny you say that because when I started college, I was pre-dental. So, you know, I, I thought I was going to go to dental school. I was a biology major. Then I switched to chemistry. And then uh, I transferred to UGA. I was at Georgia Southern before. I transferred to UGA, decided I didn't want to go to school for that long. I was like, that's going to be horrible. <laughs> and then I switched to biochemical engineering. You're just a glutton for punishment, man. Good I, I grief. Just These are just sound awful. I know. But my junior year at Georgia, I was biochemical engineering, finished up my junior year, actually. And then I was like, I started to realize what kind of jobs I was going to get. And it was going to be in a lab and stuff like that. And I was like, I, I can't do that. So I ended up talking to one of our family friends that my dad knows that we grew up together. He's a CFP. Actually, he works in the same building I do now. But Wow, what a coincidence there. But he told me about Georgia's financial planning program. So that was kind of that opened a completely different door that I hadn't thought about before because it was just like engineering or it was STEM before that I was kind of focused on. But then I realized I could do this. And then it was great because I always had an interest in business because my dad's been a business owner for as long as I've been alive. He still owns a gym. He just opened a tap room and he's owned a couple of all state agencies and stuff. Too. Serial entrepreneur is what he sounds like. Yes. So the whole math part of it interested me. And then the business part of it also interested me too. What's the tap room, just in case we have any uh, people that like <laughs> to frequent those establishments? It's called Hits Tap Room in Brazelton, Georgia. <laughs> if you're ever in Brazelton, you know, come on by Hits, right? <laughs> oh, so the, when you were talking about your father, I mean, I just brought up something else. Like, could you go for entrepreneurs? Could you go for some, like some of his buddies and his network? You know, I mean, you want to kind of carve your own path. I get that. But there's a reason why a lot of financial planning firm owners go after small business owners. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. That's always been something that's been on my horizon because, I mean, like you said, I've grown up with small business owners and I guess I understand how they think and stuff like that. It's just, I've had difficulty getting business owners to take like a leap on me at this point. I mean, you know, really I've only been doing it for two years, so I, I understand that, but uh, that's something I'm going to continue to go after. Hey, thanks for revealing that. I mean, that's really appreciate the transparency. I mean, it'll come. And maybe another question is, do you ever bring some of your more senior people or do you kind of involve them just to say like, look, I mean, I'm the one that kind of initiated this, but we got a lot of firepower here. You know, you're, you're getting the whole team. Do you ever do that? I, yeah, I did. And I, I actually did that with the biggest client I have. I brought in the oldest partner and he sat there in the meeting with me and helped me explain things and stuff like that, which that was really early on when I started. Okay. So really, really thankful that they're, they're helping me do that too. And I just want to reestablish something. I mean, like, you wanted this, this firm did not force this on you because like, Hey, Devin, like, yeah, we said you're going to you know, get paid a salary and do this, but we're changing course. We need to go out and develop a bunch of business. That's not what happened here. When I interviewed for this position, it was actually kind of a different role than I ended up having, uh, which I'm not sure if you actually heard about that. I'm sure you did though, but I got offered an associate planning position, which was just planning. It was a little more of a salary, but I actually took a pay cut so I could spend more time building my book of business. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've stopped, stop the tape. Stop that. Wait, you did what? Say that one more time. I took a pay cut so I could focus on building my business. Wow. Okay. 
<laughs> I just want to make sure we got that on record. <laughs> I mean, that's always been something I wanted to do. And at the time, I, you know, I was living at home with my parents. I had no bills. So I was, let's start this business. Let's get going while I can. And, you know, that's great. Well, Devin, what a journey, man. I mean, just a couple years in, I mean, you're rocking and, and really good stuff. Appreciate all the, you sharing all this. Any final tips or closing thoughts you might have for any new planners out there? You know, I would say just don't give up and be persistent. If you fail, especially if you fail the CFP exam, don't sweat it. I mean, it's a very hard test. Just keep studying, keep working at it. Don't give up. Thanks for coming by the show today, Devin. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the New Planner Podcast. If you're ready to discover the top career paths for financial planners and see which track is best for you, we created a free guide to help you. Grab your copy of the Financial Planner Career Roadmap at newplannerrecruiting.com slash roadmap. There, you'll also find more tools and resources all created to help you build a successful financial planning career. Tune back in next week for another episode. And until then, we're here to help you succeed.